Welcome to Gothenburg, the birthplace of implant dentistry. It is a little sad that we can't meet in person in Berlin, but we are happy to welcome you to this new online version of Inspiration Talks. The good thing is that you can be anywhere you want in time and space and still be able to join. So a warm welcome to Inspiration Talks wherever you are. My name is Charlotte Algren and I will be your host today. And we are just about to start in here, but first some quick words with Bjorn Delin. Hi Lotta, are you ready for the show? I sure am, and I'm ready to talk implant dentistry and science again. How are you? Great. Even still, I would say 2020 has been a very difficult year. We know that uh, our dentists have not even been able to see their patients. It sure has been a challenging year for dentists, but also for us. But how is the situation now? Well, it's improving. We can see that patients are now able to go back to the dentist and get the treatment they need. And also we at Dance Irona see an increase in demand for our products and solutions. And what have Dance Place Irona done during this pandemic? Well, we've been working to keep our organization and staff safe, uh, still being able to support our clinicians uh, with the products and solutions they need as they were working through the pandemic. And we have also increased our online training and webinars and still continue to focus on science and innovation to continue to improve implant dentistry and patient workflows. That sounds great. Thank you very much, Björn. Thank you. And now it's time for EIO and Inspiration Talks. Where we're in the flow. Many excellent speakers will share their insights with us today. And here with me in the studio, I have Dr. Malena Halland, an experienced oral and maxillofacial surgeon from Copenhagen. It's a great pleasure to have you here, Malena. Thank you very much, Lata. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and it's great to see you again. Thank you. And today here, we're going to talk about smart workflows that make your work flow. Mm -hmm. Malena, what does smart workflows mean to you? Well, I guess it means making things smarter. huh? creating a flow where it can take us from point A to point B in a shorter distance and maybe more easy. And uh, in my everyday life, it must be to help me get a day that is more efficient and maybe getting me ahead of my day. Yeah, being ahead of everything. That's uh, <laughs> something we all dream about. Uh, that would be nice. <laughs> so uh, now let's take a closer look at this specific part of the workflow, the actual implant and the scientific documentation. With us from London, Dr. Michael Norton. Mm. Hi, Michael. Hello, <laughs> Hello Lotta. <laughs> How are you? Thank God, very well in these difficult times. That's good to hear. And uh, we are all excited to hear your talk today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, thank you for the invitation to Inspiration Talks. Uh, I'm going to address the implant, as Lotta said, the Astrotech Implant EV, a modern dental implant inspired by a classic design. Uh, and that caption encapsulates two uh, comments made by our hosts. Number one, a modern dental implant should be one that fits into a modern workflow, a digital workflow, uh, helping us get from A to B in the shortest possible time. Uh, but at the same time, we need an implant that's based on a classic design with 30 years of tried and tested research and documentation. Where do we start? Well, I think we all understand that in the digital world of dentistry today, the digital workflow starts here with the CT scan. And this CT scan will allow us to link a virtual plan to a real world outcome. But in an optimal modern dental implant system, we should get there at all stages, utilizing the very best that digital dentistry uh, has to provide. So 
we take a case like seen in the virtual plan and we execute that virtual plan to give us uh, optimal looking, optimal fitting, optimal biologically integrated teeth on dental implants. And how do we achieve that? Well, with the AstroTech Implant EV, it's the result of a continuous evolution for 30 years. And over these 30 years or more, we have gone out of our way, in fact, to document very carefully and precisely the science and the know-how that underpins this uh, globally recognized dental implant. And it's very important to appreciate that the core of the AstroTech implant system is what we refer to as the biomanagement complex. This is the building blocks of any and all AstroTech dental implants, whether it's the EV, the previous generation, the TX, or any of the earlier uh, generations that have been and gone. And of course, having a versatile implant assortment. It's not just the digital workflow and the aesthetic outcome that matters, of course. For the implant surgeon, primary stability is key. And so we've looked in this new EV generation to introduce a slightly more aggressive apical thread design compared to the previous version. As you see here, comparing the old image of the profile implant to the new image of the short dental implant, where you see the thread depth more apparent at the apex. This gives us greater primary stability at time of placement. But for me, if anyone asked what the single most important aspect of the EV uh, implant is, it's the application of uh, science, research and development, all documented, that leads to a highly robust implant uh, that is more capable of withstanding mechanical uh, function over very many years. And then the introduction of our one position only index. You see on this image, seven arrows, six of them in the green, which represents the six position index we're all so familiar with, whether it be an internal hex, an external hex, or some other design. These six positions allow the stock abutments to be uh, rotated in six different locations. But by the application of a seventh slot, you end up with a one position only index. And this is where uniquely EV is designed specifically for the digital world. Because with the advent of the prime scan, the use of scan flows in a one position only, combined with the well-established and documented Atlantis abutment system. We are able through the virtual world to provide site-specific abutments designed, contoured and fitted in only one position so that we eradicate any risk for misseating. These Atlantis abutments, of course, can be used for cement retained or screw retained restorations, particularly with the advent of the reangulating screw, which allows us to use this even in the anterior uh, with uh, screw access to the palatal. And so when we look to the workflow and we start to understand the benefits of having an implant, that is entrenched in 30 years of documentation, but designed to meet the 21st century needs of a digitally designed restoration. The AstroTech EV implant absolutely fulfills that requirement. And for me, after 30 years of working with the AstroTech implant system, I can say with complete confidence that I'm delivering the most superb restorations on implants that I have done to date. Thank you for your time.
Thank you, Michael. It's always interesting to hear your opinion. So Marlena, do you have any comments or thoughts for Michael? Well, thank you, Michael, for a very nice uh, introduction to the EV implant for us. Um, I think it's interesting what you say is that we're having an implant now that is based on two decades of research and the new technology. But you know what? I find that our, my assistants, they don't even know the difference. I feel the difference when I get the primary stability, but my assistants doesn't know because the handling of the implant is pretty much the same. Uh, so I just think it's interesting to get such a new implant and then for the assistants, it's pretty much the same routine for them. I think that that underpins an important point. Um, so many implant companies, when they develop a new implant system, they develop a new implant. And so it becomes a whole new learning curve for everybody. The real beauty of the evolution of the Astrotech dental implant is that whilst we're moving into a, a new generation of the implant, in terms of handling, instrumentation, familiarity, yeah. I think all members of the dental team feel like they're still using the same implant system that they've always worked yes. with. And I think there's a huge benefit yeah. uh, for both the clinician, the staff, but also for the patient, because obviously everyone's feeling much more comfortable about it. Yes, exactly, I agree, yes. And we will talk much more about the Astrotech Implant EV and the digital workflow. But first, Michael, I'm curious, when do you experience flow? I'm a relative novice to digital uh, impression taking with Prime Scan, And I have to say, I've been using it for, well, uh, since I came back from COVID, just before COVID. Um, so really quite recently. And I have to say that's definitely given me a flow that I haven't experienced before. I'm loving using it. The patients are very impressed with it. And uh, uh, what I've really noticed is the, the precision of the contact points and the occlusion on the crowns that I'm getting back is even better than it was before. And to be honest, I didn't think that was possible. So that's what flows me right now. Flow for me is when you get from point A to point B and whatever activity you're doing, and you don't even realize you've done it. Um, it was just effortless and, and efficient. And it could be skiing, it could be kids, it could be speaking. And, and when that happens, you just know it and you feel it. That is where you really lose yourself and you just follow the energy. Yeah. And I think that's what we see when we have these straightforward workflows as well. That is really, then it's fun doing implant dentistry. I think when I experience flow at work is when patients' expectations and my expectations come together. We just saw him in the clip and now he's here, Mark Ludlow. Hi. Thank goodness I look okay on video just because I can't actually be there in person. So thank you for having me. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Hi, Mark. <laughs> now let's see what you're going to talk about today. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is it's very simply, is it's to think differently about how we go about our full arch treatment. Because a lot of the times I think as dentists, we all think the same. We do things the same way. We treat patients in similar ways. And to our patients who are trying to figure out who they can trust with this very extensive, expensive treatment, sometimes it can be very difficult for them to discern your practice from every other practice that is out there. And it's for that reason that I want us to think a little bit differently when it comes to this type of treatment. I want us to think differently in three different things. First, I want us to think differently than just a standard old alginate for our diagnostic visits for our patients. Secondarily, I want us to think differently when it comes to surgery, that we just don't open up the case, flatten up the ridge, and then put and start drilling and putting our implants in. We want to do things from a very efficient and accurate point of view. And thirdly, we want to think differently from the restorative standpoint, because if we've always wanted to get rid of this, now may be the time. And just to show that these just aren't one-off concepts, I'm showing three different patients in each one of these things as we move forward, and we'll see the end results at the very end. So let's begin looking at the diagnostics, is how can we think differently about this visit for a patient? 
I think every bit of the patient experience begins this, in this very first visit with us. And when a patient comes in with us and we start scanning them, it can create a very different patient experience for them. If you look at the work of Brzezinski and Yaz Blaskalu, what you see is that patients overwhelmingly prefer intraoral scans versus conventional impressions. And this is one of the big things to help us change the way people look and feel about our offices. The other thing which the scans do for us is they allow us to be able to show them their teeth in ways in which they've never seen them before. The patients have never seen these furcational involvements and this bone loss and the gum loss that they have. They've never seen how tightly their teeth are coming together before. And it's these things that will allow us to help them to understand what is actually going on in their mouth and really help us with the practice management side of getting patient acceptance with this type of case. It is from all these different things that we then move into surgery. And I honestly believe that surgery is a byproduct of all the other steps that we've taken in, in to get to this point. All of our diagnostic, all of our prosteps and surgery all come together into one. And when we also take a CBCT in that first visit, we can sit down with our patients and really explain what is going on with them and really help them understand the treatment which we're going to be rendering. We can show them the teeth that we propose for them that we're going to help move forward with them getting. We can also explain to them as much or as little as they want with the surgical portion of telling them, you know, we've got to create some space here for your prosthesis. We're going to do this with different guides. We can make sure that we get our implants exactly where we want them by using some surgical templates so that we can go ahead and get our implants directly where we need to to support those teeth which we're wanting. And we take that digital plan and then move it into the surgical arena. And we do this because if you look at the papers of Giannis and Al Morfini and multiple others, what we can see is that guided implant surgery can actually get the implants in with less deviations than we can with three-handed surgery. And if you look at these two papers as well, they talk about efficiencies. And the beauty about doing these things guided is we're able to do these things much more efficient than we would from a free-handed perspective. And it's not just from the surgical side, but it's also from the prosthodontic side to where when we go ahead and do our conversion prostheses, from the files we can get from Simplin and Atlantis, we can make pre-made provisionals that really make the conversion prosthesis part of this go significantly quicker and more predictably than just taking a denture and hogging it out and going out and doing our conversion prostheses that way. The final thing that I want us to think differently about is the way we go about our full arch restorative work. Because this right here, I think is the part that pretty much scares everybody watching this. And it, up till this point, it's honestly almost been blasphemy to do a case like this completely digital. And I'll be honest, I thought this way as well. And it hasn't been until we get really accurate scanners such as the Prime Scan to where we're getting the cross arch accuracy that we published last year, getting all the way across the full arch down to 18 microns. And even when we're looking at just the implant scans from a full arch, we can get this down to 43 microns, and this is from one of our papers that is just in the final review right now. But we know by getting a scan that accurate, we can get extremely well-fitting bars, very passive restorations, and know that we're going to be able to provide our, tr our treatment to our patients from a restorative side in a very highly accurate, highly predictable way. The other thing which it allows us to do is we can capture all the lovely things that we've got from our conversion prosthesis and from our temporaries in the same vertical, in the same occlusion, in everything that we've already worked out because all these scans will come together and cross arch mount. That's the beauty about these things of being able to get a very highly predictable result. And I hope that you've seen in just this little short presentation that truthfully, we can think differently about these things because we can truly achieve truly remarkable results and remarkable patient experiences that are different than all the other practitioners which surround us by doing things differently. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. It's so interesting to see your work. Malena, do you have any comments or questions to Mark? I'm yes, sure you have. I do. But first of all, thank you very much for a really nice presentation and fantastic work, Mark. 
Uh, interesting is that we now have on tape that the surgeon is a byproduct to the prosthodontist, which I think is good, because when I was trained in the old older days, we as surgeons were demanding where the prosthodontist could put the crowns, right? But now the scene has changed. So now the prosthodontist and the 3D and the technology is telling us as surgeons where to put the implant, which of course is the right way. Uh, but for sure, it's it's a big help for us now with the technology that we can communicate between the uh, prosthodontist and the surgeon and the lab. So I think that the technology today and what you showed us today give us so many tools other than precision and, and planning. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest things is, you know, it, it was always very hard in the past when you have a surgeon somewhere else, a restorative doc some, and in different offices to really get people to communicate together. Mm. And I think that is one of the greatest benefits of this technology is that it brings surgeon and restorative doc together in the same mm. room and everyone's looking at the same thing. Mm. And that's why I think surgery and restorative, they come they together as an absolute product yeah. of one yeah. so that we can just get the best possible treatment for our patients. Absolutely, I agree. So please stay with us, Mark and Malena. Sure. Yeah. Now, um, you have been our studio experts so far, but now it's time to hear your presentation or your perspective on workflows. Thank you, Lata. For sure, implant dentistry is a fine and advanced piece of art that we can enjoy very much. Today, we are talking about workflow, workflow in implant dentistry. And it's very important in our daily practice. It's important for me as a surgeon, and it's very important for the patient flow itself. So if we can use the technology and get the whole team to be a part of this flow, then we can make a day that is easier for the whole team, easier for me as a surgeon during the operation, and much more professional to offer the patients. We have a smoother day at the office and it's also convenient and it's also time-saving for us by the end of the day. And we can use it either in the simple cases, we can use it in the advanced cases, and also in the complex cases. I think that Ascento is a really good example of that because when we're using Ascento, we are having our assistants in the office taking the CBCT scan, taking the interoral scan, merging them, uploading them, and then finally I'm approving the treatment plan. And within a week we're getting the box with the guide, the implant, and all the tools that we need. So at the day of surgery, we have a simple surgery that is planned, that is precise and predictable. We have the option of using the custom-made healing abutment, or we can use the custom-made provisional crown uh, at the day of surgery, if we like. We can use the uh, workflow and the Ascento case, for example, in situations where we have limited access to uh, vital structures like the mental nerve or, or the sinuses. And that way we can make a treatment that is uh, precise and putting the implant exactly where we like it to be. So simple cases, advanced cases, and in this case, single cases, we can use the Ascento but we also have much more complex cases like the ones Mark talked about. Complex cases where we need to rehabilitate the whole mouth, the upper jaw and the lower jaw. And here we really need the smart flow and we need to be able to create a treatment plan that helps us to make the best outcome for the patient. A good example we would be this patient that I treated some time ago. It is a very international known saxophone player and he came to our office because he was insecure about the fact that he was getting loose teeth and he was afraid that he one day wouldn't be able to play his music instrument anymore. So using the smart fix concept we placed four implants in the upper jaw, four implants in the lower jaw and a fixed bridge in the upper and the lower jaw and by that we could help him to play the music instrument again and be who he is on stage. So for sure the smart flow could be a really good thing here as well. And by using that, we can have predictable and precise outcomes. And I believe that combining the research and the knowledge of the past with the technology of the future, we are able to help our patients 
for a better life. So I guess there's no need to worry. We have the technology, we have the science, and we have the implants to make a difference for our patients. Thank you. Thank you, Malena. And Michael and Mark, you have listened to Malena. Michael, what's your take on this? Well, I, you know, think that these these technologies, SmartFix and Azento, definitely help to uh, smooth the workflow and give a, a broader variety of treatment overall. Uh, I do have a question, though, and it regards Azento, and it's to do with the soft tissue, really. So my question is this, is how predictable is the soft tissue between placing the site-specific healing abutment and the definitive Atlantis abutment, which of course has been designed prior to surgery? Well, I think it's a very interesting question, but I must say I think it's the prosthodontist who's the best to answer this question because it is a challenge that we have, have talked about. Mark, can you help us out here? Sure. Yeah, this has been something that we were honestly concerned about when we first started doing these types of cases. But what we've come to realize is that as you follow kind of sound surgical principles and place the implant optimally for the restoration, generally the tissue stays pretty much where it's where it was at the beginning stages. And so what we've found is, you know, the maximum amount of, of kind of tissue shrinkage will get about a half millimeter. And so if we place our our restorative margin about a millimeter under the pre-op tissue, you know, almost all the time we're going to be, have that predictable result and be able to use all of the different pieces. So Malena, do you have any additional thoughts <laughs> or comments? Uh, I think it uh, just shows exactly how we need to have all different uh, part of the aspects into the discussion. We need to have the surgeon, we need to have the prosthodontist, we need to have the lab, and we need to have the reason and technology to know where we can start and where we can pretend to, to end. So I think it's a, it's a, the collaboration is, is the key in this uh, smart flow. Thank you very much, Mark and Michael, for joining us here in the studio today. We're discussing the importance of science here today. So let's see what some of your colleagues think about science. Thanks to science, we've changed people's lives. Thanks to science, we've given people second chances at a lot of things. Pertaining to implant dentistry, thanks to science, we've taken people who have been totally depressed and almost been hermits to the point that they don't want to leave their house, We've given them a new lease on life with a beautiful smile to restore both function and aesthetics. That's all because of science. We have tremendously evolved all, all because of, of, of science. Um, and it, of course it will never stop. We, we, will, we will continue to try to find out better treatment options um, and more predictable treatment options uh, to, to offer even more benefits uh, to, to our patients. Our next topic is greatly debated in the scientific community. Joining us here in the studio is Dr. Jan Derks, one of the foremost experts on periimplantitis. Welcome, Jan. Thanks, Lotta. Thanks for having me. I think a big question a lot of dentists have is, is it possible to avoid, fully avoid complications in implant treatment? I want to answer the question in a way that, I mean, to be realistic, I think probably no we can fully avoid complications. They are a reality. Um, we can minimize them. We can try to minimize the impact on, on patients, but at the same time, they are a reality. So it is fair today that we speak to our patients about uh, the probability of complications to occur and address them and then do everything that we can to prevent them. So Malena, any comments from you? Yes, I'm thinking that um we know, as you say, that periimplantitis is a difficult task and difficult to treat, and maybe preventing it is the best tool we have. So I'm thinking maybe our patient selection is not you know, strict enough. Are we letting too many patients have implants? Is it for all patients? Yeah, Marlene, I, I agree. Um, I think that patient selection is, is a critical uh, point, and I think historically we have been maybe not critical mm. uh, enough. So going forward, 
I think uh, in our risk analysis we are now better able to identify risk patients and uh, maybe already in treatment planning to offer alternatives. But the most important part is to offer proper prevention yes. to avoid the problem, as you say. And now, John, please share your thoughts on uh, the topic perimplantitis and what we know today. Now, talking management of perimplantitis, I would first like to highlight uh, something that was emphasized at the 2017 World Workshop in Chicago. And in diagnosing, in monitoring implants, what was highlighted was that it is really the probe, in other words, clinical parameters such as bleeding on probing and probing pocket depth, that are the primary tool that we should use in monitoring our implants. The radiograph indicated here is somewhat secondary. It will of course support us in our diagnosis, but it is only obtained on clinical indication. And also, it is not so much the single radiograph. What was emphasized in Chicago that it is the change over time that is relative to baseline that is interesting. So to be consistent with perimplantitis, we would ideally uh, be able to document progressive loss of marginal bone in this case. Now, managing perimplantitis, both preventing and treating the disease, includes, of course, a good understanding of the etiology. So what is important for us to understand in the management, in the prevention and treatment of perimplantitis is, of course, the cause of the disease, termed the etiological factor. And my answer to this particular question is that current evidence rather clearly points towards plaque and biofilm being the cause of the disease. Now, how can I argue that this is the case? What are the arguments today that prove that this is true? Well, there are two ways of answering this particular question. One is if we look back in time, looking at patient groups that have not attended regular maintenance care, that are not performing adequate plaque control. Well, this group of patients has a much higher risk of developing the problem. So this is one indicator. But I'll grant you that it is rather poor from a scientific point of view, as it is purely retrospective. So there's another way of looking at it, which is the stronger argument. And to illustrate this, I'll, let me show you a case. A case, clearly periimplantitis, clinical and radiographic findings are consistent with the diagnosis. The treatment now, consisting of an anti-infective approach, that is, we teach the patient how to brush, and then we decontaminate the implant surface. That is, we create access, we remove hard and soft deposits. And if we now follow the response to treatment over time, that is in this case for 12 months, we see that we reduce the probing pocket depth, the clinical signs of inflammation disappear, and we have also the radiographic response to therapy. In this particular case, no graft was used. So these are the tissues that the, pati or the patient's own tissues. So summarizing this one example of a case in terms of data from studies, clearly indicating that using this approach, removing biofilm, we are able to arrest disease progression over time. So this is today the strongest argument that it is plaque and biofilm that we have to target. And if we first now discuss prevention, this is of course allowing the patient proper access to plaque control. And that is our design of the superconstruction. It is also the choice of components. We are talking about bone level implants. So you and I, on an everyday basis, choose abutments. This is where the soft tissue integration should occur. And here the dimension is of importance. What we should avoid, and this is something we could demonstrate in our group, are short abutments, increasing the risk for periimplantitis. We have to, in case that the superconstruction does not allow access, adapt these, and in some cases even redo superconstructions that are not possible to clean. I will move now to treatment and discuss with you a little bit the flow of our uh, approach. 
I will focus now on the established periimplantitis situation, the moderate or even advanced cases. Not talking about mucositis, not about the incipient forms of periimplantitis. Cases such as these, with pronounced probing depth, pronounced bone loss, the signs of inflammation, are, to our understanding, not manageable with non-surgical therapy alone. The patient will undergo non-surgical therapy, but it is rarely sufficient. So from the beginning, our planning already includes a surgical approach. Now, <clears throat> for this surgical approach, we, whenever possible, remove the superconstruction. It facilitates the surgical procedure, consisting of full thickness flaps, removal of inflammation tissue, we expose the implant surface, then we chip off hard tissue, hard deposits, using a titanium coated carette, and then a key tool for us is the rotating titanium brush that you see to the lower left. Irrigation in this case is saline only. There are no other active ingredients other than saline. And then we complete the procedure, of course, by suturing uh, and by replacing the superconstruction. At 12 months, the response to, to therapy is, is indicated primarily by the probe. That is, we have a reduction of probing pocket depth, we have the absence of circumferential bleeding. In this particular case, there was a small bleeding spot on the buckle. And then, not surprising, in line with this positive soft tissue response, we also have a positive response, radiographically speaking. And again, no graft was used in this particular case, so the recovery of the defect, the defect fill, includes only the patient's own tissues. The question now, of course, is these kind of results, indicated here now by two examples, are these stable over time? What can we tell the patients today? Well, long-term outcomes are something that we addressed in a recent publication in our group with Dr. Kakwak as the first author. The time frame covered here, five years after non-surgical therapy, in particular, we, a surgical therapy rather, and in particular, we addressed the risk for recurrence and progression. After five years, we found that the proportion of implants showing disease progression or recurrence was 44%. This number is maybe rather quite substantial. Let me indicate to you now the primary indicator for long-term failure. And the strongest indicator was at one year after therapy, the residual probing pocket depth. In other words, if we, by surgical means, were able to reduce the pocket to a maximum of 5 mm, the situation was highly predictable over a five-year time. Vice versa, if a deep pocket um, was also found at one year, that is residual deep probing, then the risk for progression over the subsequent four years was rather high with 80%. So the primary goal, in other words, with your therapy, non-surgery or surgical, should be shallow probing pocket depth to provide stability over time. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jan, for sharing your expertise. So Malena, what's your take on Jan's topic? Well, first of all, yeah, thank you very much for a very nice uh, presentation. Thank uh, I'm thinking that in my daily practice with my patients, it's my patients' uh, compliance and attitude that has a major impact on the outcome. But I'm also thinking that our hygienists it's tremendous work on uh, education and prevention and treating the periimplantitis is very uh, important. What is your take on that? I, I completely agree with you. I think the importance of um, prevention and the role of the dental hygienist 
uh, in this work cannot be overemphasized. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's crucial, and that is preparing the patient and then maintaining the patient over time. Uh, so whenever we fail, um, both in you know, preserving perimplant health, but also fail in treating perimplantitis. I think it is a, you know, very frequently a matter of, of compliance and cooperation. Um, so I think the role of the patient as well can, is, is, is of course uh, very important in this. Yeah. So it's a collaboration between us as professionals and our patients right. to I, get the best outcome. Exactly, yeah. I think these pieces have to fit together. Yeah, I agree. In the end, everything we do as dental professional and as an industry is for the benefit of the patient to increase quality of life. And this is why Denspressorna Implants has produced this, this manual, the Supportive Therapy Manual, in cooperation with Professor Tord Berglund and Professor Mariano Sanz. And John and Malina, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and insights. It's been a pleasure to have you here today. And thank you all for joining Inspiration Talks. And please don't forget to visit our e-stand at EIO Digital Days and the Densplay Serona Implants video gallery for deep dive sessions with our speakers. See you next time. When we're in the flow.